Welcome to another CSI training program. Here at CSI, we are seriously committed to the success of your reliability-based maintenance programs using predictive and other proactive maintenance methods. Applying the tips and techniques in this program, gear analysis will enhance your RBM program, increasing uptime on gear-driven equipment due to the ability to accurately determine gear drive condition. A single channel vibration analyzer such as this one can be used to determine the gear condition and pinpoint the problems as well as determine the severity of the problems. We will use spectral and waveform data to show how to distinguish these faults and outline the best setups and measurement point locations for acquiring the best data for accurate diagnosis. Some of the common gear problems detectable with vibration analysis include gear wear, chipped or broken teeth, gear eccentricity, component misalignment, gear misalignment, improper backlash, looseness, gear resonance, hunting tooth problems, and improper meshing due to manufacturing errors. This program focuses on the most common problems, gear wear, chipped or broken teeth, misaligned gears, backlash and transmission error, as well as the effects of load. Each of these gears has particular characteristics due to its design and use that affect the data, and therefore the analysis steps. Some gears tend to show problems in specific measurement points, and camouflage problems in another. Recommendations will be made for the various gear types. Although these two gears look very different, they still perform the same job, transmit torque, and change the speed without slip. The ability to run at high speeds, the relatively low cost of the torque transmitted, and the high power to size ratio make gears the drive of choice in most industrial applications. The power can be transmitted in line, such as this gearbox, or at an angle. In either case, the speed of the driven unit can be increased or decreased and thereby affect the transmitted torque. Gearboxes are generally thought of as very complex machinery components and therefore too difficult to analyze. However, if we understand some of the basic theory and design of the gearboxes, then we will be able to more accurately determine the problems associated with them. Since torque and speed are transmitted through the teeth, the teeth must be designed to reduce wear and vibration, thereby increasing tooth life. As these teeth mesh, the clearances must be maintained, and the contact surfaces must achieve a constant force to create the longest life and smoothest operation. For smooth gear operation, two criteria for the teeth must be met. When two teeth meet, they have a common tangent. A tangent is simply a straight line that touches the circle or curve at one point. The teeth each have the same tangent at the mesh point of the teeth. They are then said to have a common tangent. When a line is drawn perpendicular to the tangent at the point of the tooth mesh, it is called a normal to the common tangent. This normal to common tangent intersects a line through the center of the gears. This point of intersection is called the pitch point. The next teeth that mesh will also define a pitch point. A circle connecting the pitch points is called the pitch circle. The diameter of this circle is called the pitch diameter and is used often in defining gear size. The speed of a gear is defined as the speed along the circle and is called pitch line velocity. ANSI AGMA, American Gear Manufacturers Association standards, are set using the pitch line velocity to categorize them. When gear teeth are designed and manufactured with this first criteria, that is, the normal to common tangent passing through the pitch point, then the gear will operate quieter and with less vibration. The second criteria is met when this pitch point is on the center line of the gears. These criteria help ensure a constant speed or constant velocity of the gears and maximizes gear life. The term for these two criteria is conjugacy. A gear set that does not meet these conditions for conjugacy constantly adjusts the speed to compensate for imperfections and severely reduces gear life. As the gear rotates to mesh with another tooth, 
the tip of this tooth is still on the normal to the common tangent line. As this tooth begins contacting, some of the force is reduced from the first tooth and shared by this new tooth. This changing of the pressure causes changes in the deflection of the teeth. Gear teeth can have many shapes and meet the condition of conjugacy, but most are unsatisfactory for modern gearing. The most common tooth shape is the involute. The involute is the curve traced by the end of a tight string as it is unwound from the circumference of a circle. There are many benefits to this tooth shape. Small errors in the center to center distance of the gears do not violate the meshing action. Another is the common tangent and the force always act in the same place and the same direction, producing the lowest noise and vibration levels. Gear shapes may differ vastly, but can have the same tooth shape. This helical gear is different from the spur gear, but the tooth shapes are the same. The angle of the teeth can vary substantially depending upon the intended use. A helical gear typically has one and a half teeth contacting through each revolution, while the spur gear has one set contacting half of the time and two sets of teeth contacting the rest of the time. This means the maximum stress a spur gear drive can carry is limited to the stress capability of only one tooth. The helical gear can typically carry the stress equal to one and a half times the stress limit of one tooth. In addition, since the teeth mesh by starting at one end and moving to the other, there is an averaging effect on the tooth profile errors so that the drive runs much smoother than the spur gear arrangement. The primary disadvantage is the slanting or spiral tooth design creates strong axial vibrations, which is rarely seen in spur gears. Some applications use a double helical configuration, which is essentially two helical gears back to back. These can be placed on the shaft in such a precise location that the axial forces cancel themselves out. When two sets of helical teeth are cut on the same gear and intersect each other, they are called a herringbone pattern. Bevel gears are similar to helical gears, except that they are cut on a cone shape and work with intersecting axis. The teeth can be either straight cut or spiral cut like these. A common application is a right angle drive. They are similar to spur gears in their operation, but are much more sensitive to assembly dimensions. They should not be used for high speed drives or where extremely high accuracy is required. Another gear type is the worm drive. The worm drive uses a shaft called a worm gear and meshes with a gear called a worm wheel. The worm gear has teeth like threads of a screw. Usually, more than one thread meshes with the worm wheel. These are typically used where a high ratio is required in right angle drives. All these gears must be machined to a very close tolerance because any errors will be magnified in the meshing action and decrease gear life. For proper meshing, the gears are placed so that the teeth of one gear do not bottom out in the other gear and only one side of the tooth should make contact. The back side of the tooth, including the tip, should not make contact during the meshing action. This clearance on the back of the teeth is called backlash. When the gears are heavily loaded, the teeth will bend or deflect, decreasing the tolerances. The tolerance must be such that the meshing action will not allow contact on the back side of the teeth. All of these design considerations affect how well the gears perform transmitting torque and reducing or increasing speed. A good design will have low noise, smooth operation, better transmission and longer life. A poor design will have loud noise and excessive vibration and transmission error will reduce the life. Another important design factor is the ratio of the teeth on the meshing gears. A gear should have a number of teeth that would cause a single tooth on the first gear to contact every tooth on the mating gear. When this is true, the gear set is said to have a proper ratio. Any imperfections in a tooth will transfer to all teeth rather than imprinting just a few teeth with the defect. For example, if a gear has 12 teeth and meshes with one that has 36 teeth, then a tooth on the first gear 
will only contact three teeth on the mating gear. Any tooth problems will then be transferred to the three teeth and cause accelerated wear of those teeth, increasing the vibration of the gear train and decreasing life. Comparing the number of teeth on each gear and factoring them to their prime numbers will determine whether the ratio is a proper ratio. A proper ratio will have no other common factors than one. A prime number is a number that cannot be divided by any number other than itself and one. Prime numbers are 1, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and so on. The number 12 can be reduced to 1 times 2 times 2 times 3. The number 15 can be reduced to 1 times 3 times 5. 12 and 15, then, have only one factor in common, 3. This common factor plays a significant role in determining some gear problems, as we will see later. Another example is a 52-tooth gear meshing with a 16-tooth gear. 52 can be factored to 1 times 2 times 2 times 13. 16 can be factored to 1 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. The factors these numbers have in common are 2 times 2. So the common factor is 4. A good gear set will have a proper ratio, that is, the common factor will be 1. An example is an 11-tooth gear meshing with a 17-tooth gear. The only common prime factor is 1. A gear set that has any other common factor than 1 is said to have an improper ratio. The ratio is useful in determining the number of teeth contacted by a tooth on the mating gear and other occurrences in a spectrum. The meshing action of the teeth will always generate noise and vibration at some amplitude. Imperfections in the teeth or gears will cause variance in the amplitude. This meshing action is called gear mesh. The frequency of this gear mesh can be easily calculated for any gear set. It is simply the number of teeth on a gear times its shaft speed. For example, for an input shaft speed of 1,200 cycles per minute with 24 teeth on it, the gear mesh frequency is 28,800 cycles per minute. Since the frequencies tend to be high, we commonly express the frequencies in cycles per second or hertz in order to work with smaller numbers. This would make the input speed 20 hertz and the gear mesh frequency 480 hertz. The mating gear is 150 teeth and its shaft speed is the ratio of the two gears. Simply divide the teeth of the first shaft by the teeth of the second shaft to obtain the ratio. This yields 0.16. Now multiply the input shaft speed by 0.16 to obtain this shaft speed. So 20 hertz times 0.16 equals 3.2 hertz. This is the shaft speed. Remember that gear mesh frequency is simply shaft speed times the number of teeth on the gear. So 150 teeth times 3.2 hertz yields 480 hertz. Notice that this is the same gear mesh frequency as calculated for the first shaft. It is important to note that the gear mesh frequency will be the same throughout the gear train where each shaft only has one gear on it. This means that the gear mesh frequency will remain constant in a multi-shaft application where there is only a single gear step from one shaft to the next. Even in a roll process such as a paper machine that has many gears, the gear mesh frequency can be the same through all the rolls of various diameters and various speeds. The only instance where there is more than one gear mesh frequency is in a double or multiple reduction gear drive, that is, the shaft has more than one gear, and these gears have a different number of teeth. This gearbox has 20 teeth on the input shaft and meshes with a 41-tooth gear on the intermediate shaft. These two will have the same gear mesh frequency. But notice that this intermediate shaft has another gear. It has 14 teeth on it. Now the gear mesh will change for this gear and its mating gear. If this intermediate shaft is turning at a speed of 10 hertz, the gear mesh frequency for the 41 tooth gear will be 410 hertz, while the 14 tooth gear would generate a gear mesh frequency of 140 hertz. 
multiple reduction gearboxes, such as this one, can be more difficult to diagnose problems due to the additional frequencies generated. In another program on bearing analysis, we pointed out that bearing frequencies are defect frequencies and should not be present in a good bearing. Unlike bearing frequencies, gear mesh frequencies will show up at some amplitude, even if the gear train is in good condition. The gear mesh frequency may be so low it does not stand out, but it is there. The design of the gears, including the tooth shape, number and spacing of teeth, as well as the machining tolerances, all affect the life, the noise, and the vibration of the gears. The next section takes a close look at some gear faults and how they show up in spectral and waveform data. In the previous section, we pointed out how gear mesh is generated and how it is directly related to the number of teeth on the gear and the speed of the shaft. Here, we will consider the effects of load on a gear set and examine some specific faults and how they show up in spectral and waveform data. The faults we will consider here are gear wear, gear misalignment, chipped or broken tooth, improper backlash, and transmission error. We have pointed out that the various types of gears will tend to show up best in certain directions. The spur gear has very little axial motion, so the radial measurement points tend to be best for analyzing them. Helical and bevel gears tend to show the most information in the axial direction due to their axial thrust. For analyzing gear drives, sometimes the quickest method to determine where to start is by comparing points. Compare the measurement points from one bearing location and select the ones with the highest amplitudes or most information. Next, compare points of the same direction from several bearing locations. This approach can help you zero in on the problem area and save time. Another helpful tool is a simple diagram of the gearbox showing each shaft, the measurement point locations, and the gear locations. It is very important to know the exact input shaft speed and the number of teeth on each gear. These will help in determining exact gear mesh frequencies and other indicators. We expect to see the gear mesh frequency for the gears, and when the gear or meshing action is not correct, the amplitude of the gear mesh may be affected. This gear mesh frequency in the upper end of the spectrum stands out considerably from the surrounding energy. Its amplitude may seem high, yet we cannot use amplitude alone to determine that a gear problem exists. The high amplitude may be due to process variables, not gear problems. One characteristic of gear mesh frequencies indicating a problem is that the gear mesh frequency is modulated by another frequency. This modulation shows up as sidebands around the gear mesh frequency. Sidebands are peaks that are evenly spaced to either side of a frequency. There may be more than one sideband on each side. One side may have more sidebands than the other. For gear mesh frequencies, the sidebands are normally spaced at the frequency of the gear with a problem. Simply set a mark at the gear mesh frequency and move the cursor to a sideband. The distance or frequency between them is the speed of the offending gear. Sometimes there are sidebands of both gears. In this case, the worst gear tends to have the highest amplitude. It is important to note that these sidebands may not be discernible if the resolution is not high enough especially in the case of multiple frequency sidebands. A second, third, or multiple harmonic of the sideband for one gear may be near the one-time sideband of the other gear, and poor resolution will cause them to appear as one peak. The presence of the sidebands points out that there is a problem, but how severe is it? A good indicator is the number and amplitude of the sidebands. In this spectrum from a pinion stand in a roll process, the gear mesh frequency is at 21 times turning speed. Notice the sideband spaced around it. They are higher in amplitude than the gear mesh frequency itself. This indicates a more severe problem. In determining severity, the actual amplitude is not as important as the relative amplitude, that is, the amplitude of the sidebands relative to the gear mesh frequency. Typically, the problem is considered severe when the sidebands approach half the amplitude of the gear mesh frequency. In routine PDM programs, it is common to detect problems with gear drives using the amplitude of the gear mesh frequency alone. 
In this case, the key is the change in amplitude. Although there may not be a serious problem with the gears, other problems such as bearing wear, misalignment and bad coupling can affect gear mesh and lead to gear degradation. Of course, some problems are obviously more severe than others. A broken tooth can indicate excessive loads on the gear and puts undue stress on the other teeth. Wear adversely affects the gear meshing action, but the gear may run longer than a gear with a broken tooth. How can we distinguish one defect from another? Although gears are generally considered to be high frequency energy, four areas of the spectrum provide key indications of the types of fault. They are the high frequency area, of course, the area at the opposite end of the spectrum, which is the subsynchronous area, the area including shaft turning speed and its multiples, and the area that falls mid-range between here and the high frequencies. Some of these frequencies can be determined through specific testing, but most of these frequencies can be located by simple calculations if we know the number of teeth on each gear and the precise input speed. A good set of gears with proper tolerances and conform to the standard set by AGMA, American Gear Manufacturers Association, should last 20 years or more. However, bearing wear, excessive loading, and imperfections in the machining and material of the parts can cause the in-service life to be reduced substantially. This spectrum is from the drive side of a paper machine. The peak at 304 hertz is the gear mesh frequency and the sidebands are spaced at one times turning speed of the shaft. The energy in the area of 100 hertz is the resonant frequency of the gear. This is a typical example of gear wear. When gears wear, the surfaces tend to strike as they mesh, exciting the natural frequency of the gear. The natural or resonant frequencies can be determined using an impact test. Of course, the testing should be done while there is a load against the teeth, so it will resemble the gear load as it is meshing. The key here is that this resonant frequency will be modulated by sidebands spaced at shaft speed. Earlier, we pointed out that the life of gears depends to a large part on the gear ratio. A proper ratio is one in which a tooth on one gear contacts every tooth on the mating gear before repeating the cycle. This is a sketch of the layout of a gearbox that drives a winder. Notice the input shaft has 24 teeth. The mating gear has 72 teeth. With this configuration, a tooth on the input shaft will only contact three teeth on the mating gear. This is a good example of what is called an improper ratio. An improper ratio such as this dramatically increases gear wear and reduces gear life. To make matters even worse, there are two output shafts and the speed of them has been increased by using 24 tooth gears. This situation can cause the analyst much frustration as he tries to pinpoint a problem. Gear wear shows up as side banding around the gear mesh frequency and excites the natural or resonant frequencies of the gear. This natural frequency usually has side bands spaced at shaft speed. Sometimes the gears could be so worn that they appear as looseness at the spectral data. The waveform may have a high level of impacting and can exceed 20 to 30 G's. Gear misalignment causes accelerated wear and an uneven pattern with excessive pitting. When left uncorrected, the gear causes other components such as bearings to fail prematurely due to the additional stress. This case history is from a double reduction gearbox driving a mixer. The misalignment is between the first and second gear. This spectrum from the input shaft is similar to the data shown for the excessive gear wear. The gear mesh frequency is at 15 times turning speed. Notice how the second harmonic of gear mesh frequency has much more energy around it. When the area around two times gear mesh is expanded, we can see the detail better. Locating the peak at 30 orders or two times gear mesh, we see that it is smaller than the peaks around it. Marking this peak, we move over to another peak to determine the spacing we see that they are sidebands equal to the speed of the input shaft. The one times shaft turning speed peak is quite high in the spectrum. 
It could indicate unbalance, a bent or eccentric shaft, or, like typical machinery components, can indicate misalignment. The waveform data is busy with impacting, but has an underlying sinusoidal waveform, which is the frequency of shaft speed. The data from the horizontal measurement of the 91 tooth gear also shows sidebands around two times gear mesh frequency spaced at one and two times its shaft speed. Gear misalignment is similar to misalignment of other common machinery components. There can often be a high one, two, or three times shaft turning speed peak. In the case of gears, the misalignment can also be at one, two, and three times gear mesh frequency, modulated by shaft speed sidebands. It is very common for the two or three times gear mesh peak to be higher than the one times gear mesh peak. Backlash is the amount of clearance between adjacent teeth while two teeth are in contact. Two little clearance can cause the teeth to hit when the tooth deflects due to heavy loads. The teeth should have enough clearance to avoid contact even when the teeth are at the outer tolerance for machining and when the stress is causing the maximum deflection. When the backlash is too small, oil can become entrapped in the teeth and will be forced out during the meshing action. This oil squirts out with a high velocity, impacting the case and exciting its natural frequencies, causing a loud noise in the gearbox. This is especially true in high-speed gearboxes where relative tooth velocities can exceed 180 feet per second. When a gear train is running with no load, the teeth can slip back and forth, impacting each other. A cure for this is simply to increase the load of the machine. The hitting on the back side of the teeth means two impacts are made for each tooth and will result in a two times gear mesh frequency. These impacts excite the gear natural frequency and cause it to appear in the spectrum with sidebands of the shaft speed. There may be multiple sidebands around the two times gear mesh frequency. The waveform will have considerable impacting with high levels. The backlash and gear wear data are similar in the fact that they both excite the gear natural frequency and it may have sidebands of shaft speed. The two differ though in the dominant gear mesh frequencies. Gear wear tends to have a dominant one times gear mesh while backlash tends to have a dominant two times gear mesh frequency. Transmission error is defined as the difference between the output shaft's location if all the teeth and gears were perfectly placed and the shaft's actual location. Earlier in this program, we showed the best design position and shape of the teeth for maintaining conjugacy. Any variation in the position of the teeth as they mesh is called transmission error. The variations can be caused by misalignment, worn bearings, as well as errors in tooth spacing, imperfections in machining, and tooth deflections due to excessive loading. All of these cause small errors in the transmission, which will show up in spectral data. Most transmission errors will show up as sidebands around the gear mesh, and they show up at the shaft speed frequency and harmonics. Sometimes the effects of transmission error will be sidebands around the gear natural frequency. Earlier we discussed the value of determining the common factor. The reciprocal or one over the common factor is another location influenced by transmission error. If the common factor is four, the spectral frequency is one-fourth the gear mesh frequency. If the common factor is two, the transmission error will be one-half the gear mesh frequency and so on. When there are multiples of gear mesh frequency, there may also be multiples of this fractional gear mesh frequency. In some cases, the half order of gear mesh will show up even when the common factor is one. This is usually when there is a machining error or spacing error in every second tooth on a gear. The analyst can usually get an indicator of the gear quality by checking the amplitude of this common factor peak. If it is half the amplitude of the primary gear mesh frequency, then there is a serious problem with gear quality. Gears can take an enormous amount of torque, and usually without damage. However, sometimes the metal does fatigue, or the force is so strong, teeth chip or break. 
This shaft was at a right angle gearbox, similar to one these gears came from. When an excessive amount of torque was placed on the driven unit, this shaft twisted in two, but the gears were not damaged. When a tooth breaks, there is a pulse that impacts once each revolution. This excites the natural frequency of the gear and may have turning speed sidebands. This should also show up at one times turning speed peak for the gear. However, it is difficult to determine the source of this one times energy. The key to determining a chipped or broken tooth is to look in the waveform. It will have sharp peaks spaced at a time interval equal to shaft frequency. It is necessary to have a period in the waveform that is long enough to capture this repeat pattern, usually five to ten shaft revolutions. This winder is the one with an improper ratio. The data taken on this point shows many sidebands of shaft speed. There are also peaks spaced at the output speed. The analyst knew some problems existed in this gear drive because of the common factor and tooth repeat frequency. However, the waveform data showed sharp spikes and two of them on the low side are spaced at the speed of the output gear. Based on this and the sharp spikes on the high side that are unevenly spaced, he estimated there were at least six broken teeth. The rebuild shop confirmed this at the teardown. Chipped, cracked or broken teeth excite the natural frequency of the gear which is modulated by shaft frequency sidebands. A high one times RPM is present for the shaft. Use the waveform to determine the source of the peak. Remember to acquire a waveform with at least five full revolutions to see the repetitive impacting. The effects of load can be seen in this gearbox, which drives two output shafts used to mix the raw ingredients for rubber tires. The raw ingredients are placed on a conveyor in 500 pound batches. One batch is dumped in, processed and out before the next is dumped. This means the load on the gear drive varies from one extreme to another in a matter of seconds. The data was collected and stored on a digital audio tape so it can be played back live to view the spectrum and waveform in the analyzer. The data we will view is from the input shaft which has a speed of 1185 CPM or about 19.88 Hertz. The gear has 24 teeth, so the gear mesh frequency is 474 Hertz. Watch the area around 474 Hertz closely. Notice that we can hear some variance in the sound as it is modulated. The sound level increased because a new batch is being dumped in. A peak is climbing out of the noise floor of the spectrum. This is the gear mesh frequency. Notice that there are no sidebands of much amplitude. The only peak is the gear mesh frequency. The load put into the system by the batch substantially affects the amplitude of the gear mesh frequency. If the gears were in good condition before the batch of rubber went into the mixer, they must still be good even though the gear mesh frequency grew. Because the load so drastically affects the gear mesh frequencies, it is important to collect all the data with the same load condition. Since the load tends to amplify the frequencies, it is best to collect the data when the machine is in load. Gear problems can be a challenge to analyze, but the most common problems gear wear, misalignment, backlash, transmission error, and chipped or broken teeth should be recognizable when you have good data. Be sure to take into consideration the effects of load. We have seen the various types of faults that can be determined with vibration analysis. Now let's set up measurement points and choose the best locations to acquire this data. The previous program, Data Collection Techniques, Discuss the best measurement point locations for gearboxes. Here we will consider the whys and how-tos for the best gearbox measurement point locations and measurement point setup. Gearboxes have high frequency occurrences that require exceptional data collection for proper analysis. Some high-speed compressors, for instance, have an input speed of 60 Hz turning a bull gear with 256 teeth. 
the gear mesh frequency is 15,360 hertz, or over 900,000 CPM. This fundamental gear mesh frequency is above the limits of some analyzers. For others, the second multiple of gear mesh frequency is beyond the capability of the analyzer. Even when the analyzer can process frequencies this high, the first gear mesh frequency of this compressor is well above the linear frequency range of most transducers. A special transducer will be required which is linear in these frequency ranges. Collecting data for these high frequencies requires special mounting techniques. Most magnet mountings provide linearity to only about 2000 Hz. Using a coupling fluid between the magnet and sensor and magnet and machine can increase this up to 5000 Hz. This is still only one third the needed range to acquire information around one times gear mesh. A threaded stud mounting with a coupling fluid can increase this range by at least two times. Fortunately, not all gear drives have such high frequencies that must be monitored. Many speed reduction gear drives have frequencies that can be monitored with a non-specialized sensor and a good magnet with a coupling fluid. For example, this gearbox has an input speed of 20 Hz and has 24 teeth on the shaft. The 20 Hz times 24 teeth yields a gear mesh frequency of 480 Hz. If we extend past the 3 times gear mesh to pick up any sidebands around it, say 3 and a quarter times gear mesh frequency, the maximum frequency is 1560 Hz. These frequencies are accessible using a good sensor and rare earth magnet or two pole magnet. The need for a special sensor usually occurs when the gear drive is a speed increaser. Let's take a look at the frequencies of interest to us on gear drives. If we have an input speed of 60 Hz and 166 teeth on the gear, the gear mesh frequency is 9960 Hz. We want to see at least the second multiple of gear mesh and five or six multiples of shaft speed past it. This dictates a maximum frequency of 20280 Hz. If the maximum number of lines of resolution is 3200, then the resolution is about six and one-third hertz of energy per line of resolution. This can help us in the high end of the spectrum to determine the status of gears, but we need to see much more than gears. We are of course concerned with multiples of shaft speed and particularly bearing frequencies. In another program on bearing analysis, we pointed out the necessity of having a resolution at least as high as 2 Hz per line to be able to accurately diagnose bearing faults. This is more than three times the resolution we have available for this gear problem. The solution is to define another measurement point for these lower frequencies. We need to define it similar to a typical spectrum for bearing analysis on any machine such as a pump of the same speed. This measurement point would help us accurately diagnose unbalance, misalignment, looseness, and bearing problems. Define this point as you would for any rolling element bearing measurement. For high speed gear analysis, define a baseband with a maximum frequency of at least two times gear mesh plus five times shaft turning speed. It is preferred to set the maximum frequency to three times gear mesh frequency if it is not outside the limits of the analyzer and sensor. Again, add an additional frequency range to include five times shaft speed beyond this to examine the upper sidebands. For narrow band analysis of this frequency range, define the first band to include the subharmonics up to two and a half times shaft speed. The second band should include the two and a half to ten and a half times shaft speed range. The third band should include everything from here up to the gear mesh frequency minus five times shaft turning speed. Note that the band did not include gear mesh or its sidebands. The fourth band should include the area around gear mesh including the sidebands. The fifth band includes all the energy above this including two times gear mesh frequency plus five times shaft speed. The sixth band should include all the energy from here to the F max and will include the area around three times gear mesh frequency. Some analysts define these last three bands in units of acceleration because the gear mesh frequencies can generate large amounts of force and acceleration is a direct measure of force. For low speed and speed reduction gearboxes where the gear mesh frequency is less than 600 Hz, 
the same parameters can be set. For programs that have the ability to specify more than six parameters, the lower frequencies can be defined as a typical bearing measurement point and simply add the bands for the gear mesh frequencies. Make sure the resolution is about two hertz per line and this measurement point definition can save you the need to make two measurements at each sensor location. Specific alarm levels can be set for each band. ANSI AGMA 6000-A88 has established criteria for defining alarm limits for different classes of gears depending on the pitch line velocity. Most analysts who monitor the gear drives in a routine PDM program have good success trending the data for change. A substantial change in the levels for any of these bands indicates some faults are developing and alerts the analyst to do an in-depth analysis. Routine surveys for single reduction parallel shaft gearboxes require a minimum of one radial and one axial measurement at each bearing location. These panels are merely access panels and do not provide a solid path to any internal web. Do not make measurements on them. However, the bolts are usually good sources of transmission because the threads tend to lock onto the case and carry the frequencies well. Use two radial measurements when troubleshooting problems in a gearbox. The extremely high frequencies associated with gearboxes may necessitate two measurements being made for each sensor location. One measurement would be low frequency, high resolution for a detection of balance, looseness, misalignment, and bearing problems. The other reading would be very high frequency to three or more times the gear mesh frequency with high resolution for determining gear condition. The direction of radial measurements should be in the line of force of the gears through the center line of the shafts. As in other measurements, we need to be as close as possible to the source of the energy with a solid transmission path through a web or internal frame to the measurement location and as close as possible to the bearings actually supporting the gears. This double reduction gearbox is typical of many in industry. Note the bearing support locations. Some of them are on an internal web. Remember that shaft vibration, including gear vibration, is transmitted through these bearings and mountings to the case. It is important to know the internal design of the gearbox to accurately place the sensor on a web reinforcement which transmits the vibrations best. If possible, stay away from voids or hollow castings. When monitoring multiple reduction gear drives such as this or other complicated configurations, set up the measurement points using tunnel vision. That is, define each measurement point with narrow bands that include only the information you need from that point. The alarms can be set for these individual bands. It is not necessary that the bands form a continuous coverage of the spectral data. Simply define the specific areas of interest that may exclude other gear meshes, other shaft speeds, and other bearings. These multiple reduction and angle gearboxes may require two radial measurement locations to be made at each bearing location as well as the axial measurement. This second radial measurement should be perpendicular to the first measurement and can provide valuable information that may not show up in the other point. Gear analysis can seem complicated due to all the energy in the spectrum and waveform. However, understanding some of the theory and design helps us know the types of problems that can occur due to their design characteristics and where they will show up. For accurate diagnosis, you need to know the number of teeth on each gear, the speed of each shaft, and the gear type. When collecting data on gear drives, be sure to acquire data to include two or three orders of gear mesh and use adequate resolution to separate sideband peaks. On multiple reduction gearboxes, use tunnel vision to zero in on the desired frequencies so you can better diagnose problems. We are confident the application of the tips and techniques presented in this program will increase your ability to accurately diagnose gear drives. Thank you for selecting CSI for all your technical training needs. We look forward to assisting you achieve success in your future endeavors.